The stories contained in this podcast are the recollections of the guests we've invited onto the show. We are an outlet for people to share their truths, and we accept no legal responsibilities for the stories contained herein. I'm Kendra Sheets. And I'm Rich Gill. And this is Enough, a podcast that aims to shine light into the darkened corners of the music industry while discussing the ways we can and should improve ourselves and in turn our community. This podcast may contain graphic descriptions of sexual abuse and assault, including rape. These accounts can be triggering, especially for those who have also experienced sexual trauma. If at any point during this podcast, you feel yourself getting triggered, we suggest taking a break and taking care of yourself before continuing. But we do ask that you continue if you are able. These conversations can be mentally and emotionally taxing, but they are so important to have. Welcome back to another episode of the Enough Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Kendra Sheets. I am your other host, Rich Gill. Um, we are lucky enough today to have our guest, Christina Cerati. Um, Christina, would you like to introduce yourself and maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into music and just kind of how that fits within your life before, during, now? <laughs> sure. So thank you for having me, first of all. I think I'm really happy and very unhappy to be here but I love your show. Thank you. Um, so my name is Christina. I'm from New York, uh, born and raised here. And um, I'm a therapist, social worker, Reiki master. A lot of my work is around trauma and violence, sexual violence specifically um, right now. But I guess backing up like 20 years, I don't really know how I got into um, music in general, but I do remember being like, eight or nine years old, being in an unhealthy environment at home um, and kind of going to music as my sanctuary, my refuge, like you guys, like so many people. Punt just sort of rose above all the other bands that I was into at the time. Because it's the best music. Agreed. Yeah, I just like, I, I was eight, um, like fourth grade. I remember like stealing my sister's CDs. I have three older sisters. And I would always go back to like the more rock kind of bands. And then that led me to basically any band that ever came out of the Bay Area. Uh, <laughs> even though I was in New York, that was like my my fantasy was living in that world. And um, it's the same thing when you're in the Midwest. Like it's yeah. you just look to the West Coast and you hone in on the Bay. It's true. It's true. Yeah. So basically anyone that ever played Gilman Street, I just was obsessed with. It became not only a huge part of like my life and my interests, but also a huge part of my identity, I would say, which was super helpful. Now I see that it was um, very much like a coping mechanism that I developed early on, which was finding other like outsiders and people that didn't necessarily fit into normal mainstream groups. So I found a lot of like um, comfort in the punk scene specifically. And when, when I was maybe, I think I was 11 when I started going to shows and that just became everything that I cared about. I would sneak off by myself. I don't think my parents will ever listen to this, but if they do, we're so sorry. We're sorry for everything, mom and dad. <laughs> just sorry about everything. You were sneaking off at 11? Yeah. Dang. Yeah, This I have this, um, if this is a podcast, it's stupid, but I have this like vampire tooth that um, basically I lost a tooth when I was 11 in a Pennywise pit. I like passed out in the, what is it? The wall of- Wall no, of death? Wall of death. Wall of death. Wall of death. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and I woke up with like blood all over my face and this tooth was missing and then it grew in crooked. So that was 11. Wow. That's some serious punk oh, crud there. <laughs> you gotta like find things that make you happy. Um, punk just became like a bit huge part of my life and it was how I made friends and how I learned about like even good books and movies and things like that, specifically things like veganism and feminism and all of the like, you know, more progressive concepts that were popping up in like, I guess this was the 90s. It was like my introduction to all of those things that later became really who I was as a person and what I wanted to do with my life. So, um, yeah, it just evolved out of there. And I can name a million bands that you guys probably grew up listening to who were like really felt like my my family more than anything else or felt like I had this personal connection to so many of these bands, which obviously comes up later for horrible reasons. But that's kind of how I got into it. And um, when I was like an early teen, it, it turned from going to like local shows to sneaking off into the city. New York City is like an hour or a half 
away from where I was I was raised. So I would pretty much every weekend just like get on a train or get a ride somewhere to get down to the city. And it's funny to me. It's not funny to me now. It's actually very scary to me now. I'm five two as an adult. So as a child, I was 90 pounds, five, whatever, wandering through Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx and Manhattan by myself with no cell phone. But it was like so worth it to go see any of those bands. And it felt totally safe because the scene itself felt safe to me. It was like, nothing's going to happen to me when I'm with these people, when I'm on my way to one of their events. It felt like this magical little safe world. So I did that as often as I could, which I think a lot of people in this scene can relate to early on. And that's how I got started. I moved to New York City very briefly when I was 18. This was like 1998. Like, it was like, because I'm so fucking old. Um, right. But it was like sketchy riding the subway at like 2 a.m. coming back from like the wetlands or like Coney Island High or something. So and and that was when I was 18. So like to be like younger than that is. Yeah, it was sketchy. I'm not arguing with that. It was not smart. And if I have I always say like if I ever had a kid, they would never be able to do any of the things I did. It's not smart. Don't do it. I know when you were talking about like feeling like you had that kind of like dome of protection almost like you're not just at the show you're going to the show you're after the show you're heading home from the show you're just involved in music and you just feel like like this weird like net of safety around you i definitely felt that like being in chicago i've i've been drunk off my ass walking back like two miles from a venue because i didn't want to pay for a cab or an uber and like there's no way that like now, just only a few years later, I would ever make a walk like that. It just, I mean, so many bad things could have happened. And I'm like, hi, after the show, like on all the endorphins, then the yeah. dopamine and maybe actually high. I don't know. <laughs> but, like, but you're just like so stoked on everything. And it's the same going to the show, like the adventure to get to a venue, especially if you don't live in the city and you have to either, you know, get the caravan of people together and drive there like we did that in LA all the time we did that when I was in high school here in Chicago going up to shows in like Milwaukee if something didn't for some reason come through the city it's just so crazy because you do really feel like you just feel invincible because like you're just so stoked on like music but that's not even like a thing (laughs) it's like a spell that you fall under and like I get it feeling now like I totally If I'm on my way to a show, it's like, I don't care about my job. I don't care about my responsibilities. It's like, I'm going to the show and these are my people and this is where I belong. And like, if I die, who cares? Because I was at the best show ever, you know, things like that. I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's the magic, I think, especially for this scene, which is like so community is like the, the thing. It's like what makes it so special, I think, which also is what makes it so horrific that so many things that you talk about on the show happen inside the scene because it's very clearly not safe all the time and it's almost like it's very very specifically like like a punk and hardcore thing because you don't really hear people who are really into like hip-hop or like country music or edm juggalos maybe but like (laughs) you know no one else like no other genre of music is like oh it's like my family and i just like it's a big community and i just feel safe kenny chesney fans are not you know (laughs) saying that early brian maybe they do Maybe I do. That's That's true. I'm not. (laughs) So going off of all that, let's get into the reason that you're here, which is feeling like this community of people and this genre of music is your family and then experiencing what can be described as one of the ultimate betrayals from a, you know, member of your chosen family. Yeah. What a great way to frame that. Um, I guess I would add first that without being too specific, my experience, like so many other people, was going into or seeking out another community as an escape from a f- actual family that didn't feel safe uh, most of the time. So it was like even more important to me that these people that I, you know, even if it was just in my imagination, they at least presented themselves as caring very deeply about the safety and sovereignty of women and, you know, equality and protecting each other and feminism as a whole. Like that's, that's pretty much how I learned about what it even meant to be a feminist. And it became really appealing to me. So I don't think it was an accident that that part of the scene became so important to me. That being said, 
that's why I was running off to the city or to shows every weekend because I needed an escape from what I felt was kind of a betrayal of trust in my own family and um, a lot of violence. So I was older at this point. I had actually just graduated college. There was like a few month period where I was living back with my parents before I moved out. And I went off to the city to see one of, if not my actual favorite band from the time that I was, I think, nine, ten. Uh, yeah, definitely from before I was even a teenager. Yeah. So I went to see this band play in this venue in Brooklyn. I had seen them a million times before. They were one of my favorite bands to see live. I obviously went right up to the front row. And during the show, the lead singer and I had that moment where they're like, you lock eyes and then you're just singing to each other, you know, which happens like briefly throughout shows. But this time it was like the whole rest of the show. He was just it felt like he was just singing to me, which was like the best thing that could ever happen to me in my mind. It was so exciting. And I was like, he sees me, which is also really weird because feeling like these are your family. But then it being so like unusual to even be noticed by them like that's a red flag to me like how excited you get just to be like looked at by the person that you feel that you know so deeply right if that makes sense so throughout the whole show we were like we had this connection we were singing to each other as soon as the show ended the lead singer hopped off the stage the rest of the band left the crowd kind of dispersed and he walked right up to me introduced himself asked me where I was from and it turned out he was going to either a few weeks, maybe a month at most after that. He was going to be in my area as part of a film festival that happens every year in my area. And he was part of a documentary about protest songs. So even that, it was like he was just like wooing me, like not even intentionally. I was just like, everything about this is exciting and inviting. And I just want to be part of it. So we talked for a little bit. He We exchanged numbers. He said he wanted to take me to dinner and ha we had all these plans. He was going to introduce me to all these people in the town and at the film festival. And then that was it. We left. We had each other's numbers. I went home. I remember talking to my dad. I think it was like the day or the night before I actually met up with this person. And um, my parents always said things like that I was just a groupie. Um, that was a phrase they always used. Like they didn't understand why it was so important to me. They just thought I like had a crush on these guys or something or I don't really know what they thought. But so I was telling my dad how exciting it was that I basically met my idol. And he obviously was like red flagged. <laughs> don't go meet up with this guy. You don't even know him. Obviously, he wouldn't just give his number to a random person just to be nice. Obviously, I didn't really want to hear that. So I ignored that. And I ended up sneaking out that night, the night that um, the film festival was happening. Um, I snuck out and I drove to the town. It's like one town over from where I still live. And I went to this film screening. Immediately after the screening, he came and found me, the singer. And basically, instead of going to dinner or anything like that, he asked me to drive him to this party that was happening basically in the woods which I did. And um, on the way there, it just became more and more clear that he was like hitting on me and being touchy and just telling me how cute I was and how um, how sweet I was and how he wanted to like have not have a relationship. He never used that word, but it was very clear. It was like, this is a big deal for both of us. And he knew very much like how important he was in my life up to that point. Um, I should say also through my entire youth, basically, I always had pictures of this guy like on my bedroom wall, in my locker at school. He was like one of my biggest crushes and idols and like one of the first like political punk bands that I ever really got into, which was also really important. And it made me feel like they stood apart from other punk bands. It wasn't just about fun. It was like they had a strong message, which was really important to me. So um, we're driving around, we're going to this party, and on the way, he asked me to pull over in this empty parking lot, I believe it was, and he tried to get me to go into the back seat with him. And first of all, I was driving my grandfather's Buick, and I didn't want to. I thought that was like 
so wrong. I was picturing my grandfather the whole time. I was horrible. I gave a couple excuses. He was pretty persistent. And finally, I was like, I have my period, which was the first time I've ever used that excuse, but it seemed to work. And then uh, we just, he was like, fine, whatever. He tried a few things. It wasn't that big of a deal to me at the time. Um, we went to this party. And at this party, he is walking around like with his arm around me, introducing me to people as his girlfriend, introducing me to these like directors and producers and other musicians in the film. It was a really cool experience. And I was just like letting my guard down a lot because I was happy to be there. And this was somebody that I felt like I knew really well and could trust, obviously. After the party, um, this other girl was hanging around. She also was a big fan of his. And she and I became friends because we're talking about all the bands we love. And we obviously connected. And she wasn't a threat to me or anything. I thought we could all hang out and it would be fun. We could continue on the night. But at a certain point, this man literally looked both of us up and down for like a solid 30 seconds and then turned to me and said, let's drive her home. Basically signaling like, he chose me, which was horrifying and flattering at the same time. So we drove her home and we drove her to this house. It's a pretty famous house that I won't name, but she was staying there at the time. And uh, we got there and the door was locked or something. The person that was supposed to let her in wasn't there. So she's climbing through the window, um, which I, I was just thinking this whole night was hilarious. Like I couldn't have made it up. So this girl is climbing through the window back into her house and it's like pitch black outside. We're alone. I'm alone on the porch with this guy who I idolize and he grabs me and kisses me. And I honestly don't even know what my emotions were at that point. I think it was probably literally everything. And I kind of like froze. Now I recognize like I went into like fawn mode. You know, it was a little bit scary and um, I should also say I had a very serious boyfriend at the time who was away out of the country. We had been together for about four years and I had no intention of cheating on him, which is why I didn't really, I wasn't really concerned about hanging out with this person because it was, it didn't seem like a date to me. I also, I still think it's funny, like what I wore that night and I see in pictures I wore like jeans and a striped sweater and like I looked gross. I wasn't wearing makeup or anything. It was like clearly. Yeah, you were not getting dolled up to go on a no. fancy first date or anything. Absolutely not. No. And I think I probably did that on purpose too to like send a clear message like this is just cool. I'm happy to be here again. Okay. You got like no makeup, <laughs> grandpa's yeah. view at climbing out windows. Like you were just going on an adventure and yeah. he's looking for something a little bit more. Exactly. So it was a kiss. I immediately felt like the worst person in the world. And I'm already playing the conversation in my head of how I'm going to explain this to my boyfriend. And will he forgive me? And is this the end of my relationship? And all of these things are playing out. So I didn't think it would go beyond that. However, we continue driving on and I have to bring this person back to this like CD hotel lodge that he's staying at for the night. And on the way back, he tells me, I just recorded a song with Billy Bragg and no one on earth has heard it yet. And it's so fucking good. And you're going to die when you hear it. And I like lost my mind. I was like, I have to hear this song. So he was like, OK, just come in my room real quick. I'll play you this song before we got back to his room. We went to the shitty bar at the hotel and I was straight edge and this person was straight edge and he is very famously straight edge and which is a major reason that I was straight edge. But that night he told me that his fiance had just cheated on him and moved away to England with her new boyfriend and he decided he was going to break edge. So we both did together. And we were drinking, I think, like Coronas at the bar. I don't even know. I do know that after a beer or two, he started ordering pickleback shots. So I was doing those for the first time. So again, I'm like 100 pounds, so it's already too much. But I don't know. Like two Coronas is too much. And now you're doing pickleback shots for the first time Yeah, at 100 pounds. Oh, my yeah. God. 
Right. Well, and that's also, you've never drank before at this point, right? You've been straight. Yeah. So you have no idea of tolerance or um, uh, alcohol percentage or anything like that. You're also with someone who you have idolized for a very long time, who you like, even if you're not interested in them romantically, you're like low-key trying to impress because you want to see mm-hmm. Clay. So like you're drinking like dirt beers being like, mm, delicious. <laughs> oh, picklebacks. Yeah. I'm like, mm, no, I'm good. Don't worry about it. Exactly. And um, also at this point, the guy, I want to say he was about 40 and I was 22. So I don't know if I believe that he had never, if he had always been straight edge. I honestly don't know. But At least he had more experience around alcohol, even if he had never um, had any. So I get what a pickleback was, and that's not like a regular (laughs) shot. So that's what I was going to say next. I had never even heard of that before, but he just like walked up to the bar and ordered them. So again, red flags all around. But so we're dancing. And again, this is another, I don't dance still. He clearly does not dance and shouldn't. Um, I do wish there were videos of that part of the night. You guys know, and you can picture it. I'll just leave. Finger guns. I'm picturing nothing but finger (laughs) guns. Tight black pants. They're probably your guns. Yeah. It was not good. But my, I, I, my brain is already mush, right? So that was the point that he told me about this amazing new song that he had just recorded with Billy Billy Bragg. So his hotel room was like around the corner. We went to his room and I am still, by the way, saying that I have my period because it's come up a few other times. But as soon as we got to his room, which was like a tiny, dingy, like dorm room, basically with bunk beds and like a wooden dresser, wooden bunk beds, and that's it. So he closes the door, he locks the door, And then before I can even turn around or, you know, look for the computer that he was going to play this song on, uh, it didn't even occur to me to ask. He screamed football tackle and tackled me onto the bed, which is like the most terrifying way to begin a sexual assault, I would say. Like, it sounded playful. And he was giggling about it. But also, as soon as I hit the bed, he put his hand around my throat and basically turned into a monster. Like, to this day, I still have flashes of his face kind of above me, holding me down. And he only needed one hand to hold my entire body down because it was around my throat. And he is... Not a large person, but definitely larger and stronger than I was, am. And um, he just proceeded to violently attack me. I won't get into, like, details, but there were several moments that I thought I was dying. I definitely may have passed out or I thought I was about to pass out. I couldn't breathe. I didn't have any oxygen. I was crying, screaming, telling him to stop. But he didn't. And it went on for a very long time. I couldn't tell you how long. I just know it was the most terrifying thing I've ever experienced. Um, Probably the most confusing thing I've ever experienced. Because in the same moment, it was (laughs) this person. Like, I can remember lying in bed as like a teenager and looking up to see this person's face smiling like with his guitar and his bandmates right and now I am in the same position being held in place by that same man who is just unrecognizable and I can't stress how violent he was and became and how much I fully believed I was just going to die that he was going to kill me I don't know if there are any other details that are like important enough to share but you can imagine what it was like. And I tried to stop it over and over and just basically come in. So eventually I just kind of froze. I would, I probably, um, I think I just stopped fighting. And at one point he said he was getting a condom and still holding me down with one arm. So he was like communicating with me at the same time and pretending he wanted to make it safe, which was also very confusing. 
as he's choking you, he wants to yeah. make it safe. Exactly. At the time, it made no sense. Now it makes no sense. It just made it even scarier because, like, my brain was just not com- computing these, like, very mixed signals on pretty much every level, like, emotionally, physically, psychologically. When he was done, he immediately almost fell asleep on top of me and I couldn't move. So I remember just waiting and waiting and wondering if I could like somehow slither out and leave and like get back to my car. At this point, I don't even know where my car is. It was terrifying. That's the part that I remember the most about that whole experience was like the feeling of afterwards when he basically didn't give a shit about me anymore. And I was just this person in his like shitty hotel room bed. I didn't even know if he would remember me the next day, right? Because he was so drunk too. Eventually, I was able to like slide out from under him without waking him up, I guess. I found the condom uh, fully unopened, still in its wrapper under the pillow. So he had not used it. And I, I got out of there. Don't even remember driving home, honestly. But the next thing I remember is that he started texting me. Why did you leave? I had visions of wandering the streets with you hand in hand and going to get lunch at this cute little restaurant. And like, I don't even remember, but along those lines of like, what happened? I thought we were having this like romantic date, I guess. I didn't respond to any of that. It was so still so confusing. And I was so like disgusted more than anything else. The, the feeling of betrayal didn't really sink in until later when I really like thought about what had happened and what it meant to me for me. Probably in shock. I think I was. And I think that's why I don't remember like getting home or a lot of that next day or couple days. And I, again, I had to just like go to work and carry on. Pretend to be normal like nothing ever happened. yeah. Right. And, you know, another part of it is like other people knew I was going to this event. Like they knew I was meeting this guy that was important to me. Right. My dad, I I never brought it up again. Hopefully he thinks I never went. But like part of me wanted to be like, hey, I just spent the night with whoever or like it's so cool that I went to this event as like a VIP and I went to this party. But like so like shame and a weird pride also kind of started to mix together and of course like the weird feeling of like he chose me which is disgusting to me now but at the time it was like it was all just very confusing and shocking I think shock it was definitely the major thing that was happening in my body so I never responded to those texts he um basically like we stopped talking after that because I never responded he texted me a few times after that like next few days but like nothing he didn't obviously address what he had done or obviously he didn't apologize like they would never apologize but it was just like it didn't happen and almost like he was trying to make me feel bad for him that I didn't want to like hang out the next day it was like a guilt trip thing so I let it go Um, a bunch of other things happened which I'll like come back to but A few months after that, I had a pregnancy scare and freaked out, obviously, and I texted him about it and he ignored me. And I was like very clear, like my boyfriend is out of the country. So kind of lines up. There hasn't been anyone else. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so he just flat out ignored it. Never responded at all. Months and months later, he was back in another local town, I don't remember, and he texted me to meet up with him again. I don't remember the wording, but it was something like, hey, I'm coming through your town, would love to see you, you know, and probably like kissy emojis or something like that, like this cutesy, flirty language. The old punk rock on tour booty call. Exactly. I remember those. I Yeah, and I ignored that, of course. I and basically that's how it ended my my contact with this person never another word um when i didn't respond to his booty call i guess as far as he knows i could have his baby <laughs> this just occurred to me too <laughs> like there could be a baby but he wouldn't he doesn't know there isn't thank god 
But I think a major reason it impacted me so much even now is because eventually I had to kind of come clean to my boyfriend because that relationship was really important to me. Like we had been through a lot already. We kind of stuck it out as he was in different countries. We had our whole college life together. So it was like we were going to get married. We talked about it all the time. We were going to like move in together after he graduated. But I had to tell him over Skype that I kissed this person. And he already knew how much this person meant to me. So I thought that if I just said like, hey, listen, this was a situation. He kissed me. I definitely didn't like turn him down. But I couldn't bring myself to tell him the rest of it. So to this day, he doesn't know that it wasn't just a kiss, that I was like violently raped by this person. He just thinks that I cheated on him with the singer of my favorite band, which was like so, I don't know what the word would be for him, but it must have just felt like so insulting and like just such a like minimization of our relationship. Like I gave away our whole four year relationship for like to kiss my about favorite One singer. One moment. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it wasn't it didn't feel fair to me, but I also still I was more more willing to give up my relationship than to tell him the truth about what had happened to me. And that's how it was with everyone in my life. I never told anyone. Which is such a heartbreaking like position to be in. Like I, I can't imagine. It was. it was. It was heartbreak on top of heartbreak, honestly, because Obviously, that relationship ended, and this was most of the reason for it. And even as we were breaking up, even like during like the the cry sights you have at the end of a long relationship, I still wouldn't tell him the truth. I think it was mainly because I was embarrassed about it and just felt stupid. You know, all of those emotions that come to a victim after the facts where they're like, well, what did I do to bring it on? What could I have done differently? How many ways was this my fault? And in this case, I could think of a bunch of ways. You know, I was drinking. I was alone in his hotel room. What did I expect? I was driving him. You know, I don't have to explain that part to you guys. But yeah, I very much felt ashamed about it. And I let that just kind of simmer internally. And I didn't share it with anyone for years and years and years. And the betrayal part of it came later. But even now that's the piece that still kind of like hurts the most I would say or is the most painful part of this because just the fact of it that one of the people that I trusted maybe for silly reasons but just kind of like put all of my faith and trust in as a person as a group as like a public figure I don't know I don't want to say relationship but almost as a friend at that point had done something that was like so contrary to literally everything I had ever heard come out of his mouth, everything they had ever said in public, every song they ever wrote, it just like it didn't make any sense to me. And because I had turned to them specifically as like a sanctuary from another abusive really a situation, it was like, I don't know, like a double gut punch. And then to have to kind of betray my own boyfriend as a result of it I'm like I honestly don't it took me years and years and years to recover from that and the the thing about betrayal is still something I work on even in therapy currently like my therapist calls it my betrayal wound and we're like oh he's trying to process it and point to where it started and what made it worse and it, it it's like so clearly it's crazy that literally like you said Kendra like one moment totally upended my life and this person has no fucking idea and probably doesn't give a shit one thing I did want to mention I just I know that people are going to be like oh how could you not know it was a date and like blah 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 when it hurt yep so you exchange numbers so I assume you were texting in the interim between that first show and then Not really, actually. It wasn't ever like, hey, what's up? How are you doing? It was always, it was just like brief interactions all revolving around meeting up. There was no like getting to know each other. I told him 
the the night that we met at his show, I told him I had a boyfriend who was in another country at the time. It was clear from the get go. And he, I don't know, either he put on a good show or just didn't seem to care. I don't know. But um, I thought it was clear. And of course, like in the back of my mind, I probably wanted him to want to take me on a date. But I feel like I tried to put up all these barriers to it, too. I like not looking good. And right. I don't know, hanging out with this other girl and saying I had my period and bringing up my boyfriend a bunch of times. Of course, I could have been more direct about it. And I should have been. And I would be now, of course. At the same time, like you can say all that, but there was no outwardly, hey, I want to take you out on a date at this Mm -hmm. event that I'm going to be at and like make sure you you dress up and like we're going to go. I'm going to tell everyone there that you're my girlfriend. Right, right. There was none of that talked about beforehand. So there would be no reason for you to think that. Plus, I was half his age. Like, I did think that mattered. And until he told me his fiance cheated on him, I did think he was engaged because obviously I knew a lot about this person. You know, Rich and I have talked about this before on the pod. And I, I think it needs to be mentioned that Despite the age difference, there's always some sort of power dynamic when there's, especially in this situation, he's 40, you're in your early 20s, he's up on stage, you're singing all the words, direct the words he wrote with his band that's been playing for decades. And Mm -hmm. you're looking at him and he's looking down at you and he hops off the stage and goes beelines for you as soon as the show's over. And you're like, (gasps) and even if you were not attracted to him in like a conventional exterior appearance way. There are all these things, like you said, this person helped you build your lifestyle yeah, based on the things that he said into a microphone in one way or another, whether it's in between songs, because they do love to tell you all about mm-hmm. themselves in between the songs or in the songs themselves and like the politics and, you know, what's wrong with the country and how do you move forward as a thoughtful individual in this scene? And they help build that version of you you know you were talking about pictures of people and bands and like i plastered my high school locker with people and it's not that i was like i had crushes on them but it's not like woo i can't wait to see you naked kind of crush it's like right you are the most inspiring creature that's ever graced my like ear cavities and i want you to understand how much you mean to me and if i got a moment to say that to them i would be like a creepy weirdo to be like you've changed my life yeah. like shaking them it's not like this is like fucking bruce springsteen or some shit this is a person who you can find at the bar or right. like at the restaurant the vegan restaurant down the street like in chicago i know exactly where to go to find bands before during and after sets like yeah especially punk bands like everyone's so much more accessible because everything is scaled down on such while they're still like these really heavy hitters, their likes are like 17,000, 71,000. Like, and you look at, you know, Bruce Springsteen again, you got 17 million. Like, so you have to look at the perspective here. So these are people that are actually very accessible in a lot of ways. And that can be really great on the fan side. And that can be really detrimental also if you have someone who acts in a predatory manner like this situation. Yeah, absolutely. And over the years, like, especially when like, People started speaking up around the Me Too movement. Like, is he going to be called out? Like, is this, how many times has he done this? And I was kind of like waiting and waiting. I didn't think I'd ever like have the guts to do it myself. But over the years, like I would Google, I would try to find like, has anyone reported him? Has anyone called him out? Like, has he done this before? And then I never found anything, which also was kind of frightening. Like, what if it was only me? And then if no one believes me because he's like such a hero to so many people right and actually Courtney uh Oubliette from Tsunami Bomb is the person who connected me to you guys and we were driving back from a festival and talking about creeps and bands and predators and all of her stories from decades like two of women in a car do like, yeah <laughs> that's a normal conversation I'm not even kidding <laughs> no no yeah absolutely that's Especially like people who are into the same bands. It just comes up. It's like this one and this one and this one. So I mentioned this one and she shared a story that she had witnessed of him being creepy. And then later that night after she connected me to you, she actually found one sentence on an old Tumblr blog saying 
this person's the name. It was just a comment, a long article calling out a bunch of people. One person commented saying this person's name and then said, I can't be the only one. And Courtney sent that to me and said it was haunting. And it really was because it just kind of like sat there on its own. Nobody said a word. So then I I made a quick Tumblr account. I don't have one. And I was like, no, it happened to me too. And then that was a couple of weeks ago. And since then, two more women have come on and just commented, me too. So hopefully people put the pieces together and this starts to get talked about. Is he still out there touring? He's headlining festivals. They're headlining festivals. They're still preaching the same rhetoric about, you know, caring about women and protecting women and speaking out against violence and like the most ironic shit, basically the opposite of what I saw that night. And it, it makes me so angry, like more than anything, it's like betrayal and rage that he's allowed to still have this platform to just lie and lure people in. It feels like a lure to be like, come hang out with me. I'm so safe. Look how much I'll protect you. I've been campaigning for your protection for decades and decades. And that's not who he really is. Like as we're sitting here, like in my head, I'm like trying to calculate the levels of betrayal. Someone's sexually assaulting you, which is a, a betrayal just on a human level. There's the, this person's supposed to be a member of the punk scene and we're like, we're all a family and, you know, we take care of each other. There's that betrayal. There's a person that you were friendly with who invited you to this, who is ostensibly supposed to keep you safe. There's that betrayal. And then they posit themselves as a feminist and supporting women's rights and women's organizations. It's ongoing. It's so many levels. And then you, you just dump a bunch of gaslighting all over everything. <laughs> There's right. there like eight levels of gaslighting where he's like, uh -huh. I guess I'll just not talk about the fact that I like screamed football tackle, which when you when you hear it just like on its own that this happened, you're like, wow, that's weird. And then he jumped on a bed. But then you're like, no, he jumped on me with his hand around my throat. And then immediately shoved his dick down my throat. Sorry <laughs> to throw that. You can say that. You're fine. <laughs> But it's, it's it. like you said in the pre-interview also, like, it's like a switch flipped. It was just like, oh, he was goofing around and then immediately his mm -hmm. dick was down my throat and his yeah. hand was around my neck. Yeah. And I never heard that Billy Bragg song. So another, betra <laughs> another, another betrayal. betrayal. <laughs> another betrayal. Did it even even come out? We don't even know because I Googled it after we talked and I couldn't find it. No so. way. Maybe it didn't exist. It could be. Yeah. All right, so, let's, let's move forward, pivot up of some of this sad silliness, which is what we're known for, um, <laughs> and talk a little bit about how you were able to take this absolutely god-awful, terrible thing that happened to you and make it into something that you were interested in in studying. It makes, It's now your current career and, and working through that while you're actually helping other people process that. Let's talk about a little bit about kind of what you do now, years later. Well, yeah, well, I am a therapist now. And I always say I'm a trauma-informed therapist. I think that's really important because that's who I would want to go to. So I work with all genders, all ages now, but I would say most often I'm working with women who have experienced trauma because who hasn't, specifically sexual trauma because honestly, who hasn't? And I'm also a Reiki master, so I do like energy work. And a lot of my sessions are about kind of locating where certain traumas and traumatic experiences live in your body and the way that you hold on to these horrific things that happen to you and how that affects you on a physical level, an emotional level, a spiritual level, and working through that. So it's a lot of deep, dark trauma stuff. It's a lot of like very positive recovery and healing. It's all about the healing process and processing the things that have happened. Prior to this, like this kind of all came about after like a decade or two in social services. I was trained as a social worker. And one of the first things I did was work at a domestic violence agency, I'll say. And I was a counselor for victims, survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And I was a case manager in foster care. So I worked with children who were neglected or abused, most often sexually abused, a lot of the time by their own family members. 
so this has kind of always been, I don't want to say my interest, but something that I've been drawn to. And again, because of my own experience in my own family and childhood, it just came naturally. And it was something I was like determined to cut into however I could. So after this, I was always kind of going back and forth. Do I want to be a writer? Do I want to be a social worker? I've always loved both equally, probably writing even more. But after this happened, it sparked this time in my life where it was like, yeah, there's no time for writing. <laughs> like I have to, there's always, I always write. But it's like, it felt so urgent to be like, this work needs to be done and more people need to do it. And at least more people need to be talking about it and feeling like they have resources or places to go or people to talk to that understand what that's like. So I mean, honestly, it's a gift now that I have to be able to say like, I've been in that situation i know what it's like to be like irreparably harmed by someone that you think cares about you or or is there to protect you and that's not even just with this situation but in general so yeah i it's totally informed like how i do my work definitely the types of people that are drawn to me are always like creatives like artists musicians this area that i live in is really cool and that it is home to a lot of those people. So it very much kind of naturally evolved into a practice where I can work specifically with creative people who have survived horrible things like this and find a way to process that, heal it, turn it into something meaningful for them. So it's like this cycle that I like to start with clients. How can you turn that thing that happened to you into something impactful or meaningful or helpful for someone else. And honestly, I don't know if I would have arrived here without this experience specifically. And like that, what happens in a situation like that is like this deep feeling of aloneness, especially when you don't talk about it or share it and there's shame piled on top of it. So being able to like just on the most basic level say like you're not alone and here are people and places and resources that you can go to and feel actually safe in and there are actually safe spaces <laughs> and people trying to make spaces safer and people in the punk scene that actually give a shit not all hope is lost like I felt very hopeless for a long time but yeah so it kind of like propels itself forward I still listen to punk I still go to shows for a while I didn't I couldn't and I can't hear that man's voice at all. I can't. I saw a picture of him recently and wanted to throw up. So, like, I did lose some of that, like that specific subgenre of like political street punk from the East Coast. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think I've just tried to find ways to turn it into something good and not just let it like continue to ruin my life and make me question my identity and everything else about myself. You know, it is, it's very easy to just completely shut down and go to a dark place. And like, that's some, that's the reason why so many people who have dealt with trauma, especially sexual assault and rape become drug addicts, alcoholics, unalive themselves. It's, mm -hmm. Because it's so, like we keep saying, such a betrayal and it's so traumatic, it can feel like there's no way out of it. Like things are never going to get better. I'm always going to be this, you know, for lack of a better term, like broken person. Yeah. Another, it's, it is heartbreaking. Like that's another level of like loss. To me, a lot of this is about loss and like grieving even if it's just an idea of safety and community and family that maybe wasn't even real. But the fact that you used to feel like you could go to a place and be safe and now you can't, that's such a loss. And it's such like Rich was just saying, like a lot of people don't recover from that and for good, obvious reasons. And there's really nobody who's doing anything about that, who's monitoring the punk scene right to be like is everyone cool are you being cool are you being respectful like you guys are now and a lot of your guests are but like there are no rules right it's so cold we're like an island where we come up with our own like rule book there's a lot of unspoken agreements involving like basic respect and 
compassion and like looking out for each other. And then when those rules are broken, nothing happens. And those same bands can continue playing and writing songs about how respectful and progressive and compassionate they are. And there's nobody saying like, that's not true. You just fucking raped someone this weekend and it's just allowed to continue. So I don't know what like the solution is. It just definitely contributes to like this sense of anger and disgust. And I could see why some people just gravitate away from this scene over time. Because like like Rich was saying, it's very specific to the scene. Like a lot of a lot of people don't like hang their whole lives on a music scene, um, but we do. And then if it's fucked with what do you do when yeah what do you do at that point that was one of the things like when we were talked about starting the podcast at the beginning it had been because i was this kind of lightning rod of all of these different stories i had my own stories and things that i'd witnessed and then other people were sharing stories with me and then rich had his situation where people were sharing stories with him up in minneapolis and it's kind of like if you don't clean up your own house, your house is going to be a fucking pit. Like, I don't want to live in a fucking pit and I don't want to move out of my house. I established this house. I bought this house. I pay on this house. I got a mortgage on this house. Like, I've been 20 plus years in this goddamn house. Like, I'm not leaving. You can't make me leave. You're not going to evict me. I would need to clean up the house. There, I don't know that there is an answer to some of the questions that you posed. But the only thing I can think of is that so many people don't think this is a serious situation. When these things happen, they think, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate we saw it like through COVID. People don't think that there are repercussions until it happens to them. It doesn't it's not real. And if, you know, they hear about this person, they're like, well, it wasn't me or I'm a male. It's not going to happen to me or I take care of my wife at shows, so it's never going to happen or it's not, you know, therefore it's not real. And I think the thing that, you know, the point of view that we have to all have is that we have to be accountable for our own actions. We have to be accountable for how we affect other people. And, you know, all of us have done something. We, we've talked about this before in, in previous episodes, too. Everyone's done something harmful at some point, and you don't, you may not even realize it. You know, maybe you were drunk, maybe you were high, maybe you were completely stone cold sober, and you're just, your point of view on something was not the same as the other person. But if someone comes to you and they say, you've hurt me in this way, you just, don't go, uh-uh, no, <laughs> you know? I would have never done that. I'm a good person. I'm the hero in my story. I'm the main character. I would have never done that. I think the people that comprise this scene are a very specific type of people. We are proud. We are tough. We know what we want, even if we change our minds five or six times, we still know what we want. And so when someone comes to us and says, like, you know, you need to be accountable for your actions, or this band is problematic, and you are playing a show with them, the first kind of instinct is like, well, I didn't do it. It's fine. They're going to get me on a major show in my hometown. Why would I not? Or they've always been cool to me. <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my thing. That's my favorite shitty response. So they're never like great that. to me. Yeah. 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 Or, I didn't really listen to them, <laughs> but... So you can ride their coattails even though you don't like their music. Okay. But I think that we we all need to be, you know, as responsible as possible for some of the things because this is our community. This is our chosen family. If you're going to confront your shitty, drunk, racist uncle at Thanksgiving, why wouldn't you confront your shitty, drunk, racist frontman at a show? Would you be able to talk a little bit about why you decided to come forward and share your story and why you felt like that was important? Yeah, it's a good question. To be very honest, besides the fact that I just had this conversation with Courtney a few weeks ago and it felt um, like I was able to verbalize it for the first time to people that not only understand how wrong it is objectively, but just the context of it as well. Honestly, I don't know that I would have shared it in any other platform maybe like online eventually if if I had found that Tumblr blog, I don't know. But um, specifically the way that you guys present these stories and the agency that you give to your guests and the way that you always share the background and why this is so meaningful. It's not just like this singer assaulted someone. It's like this person who was had such an impact on this other person's life, whether it was a photographer or a 
road manager, whatever, all of the different versions of this that you guys have gone into. So one, the platform that you guys have created. And two, the personal part of it is that I just, within the last six months to a year, ended another long-term, very meaningful relationship that was actually nine years. And this person, we were, again, engaged, going to be married, live together, the whole thing, inseparable. And he did something that was a betrayal. And honestly, like, I do think about this, like if this situation hadn't happened with this singer, maybe I would experience this differently. Maybe it wouldn't be so hurtful, like such a, a deal breaker for me. Maybe I would be able to weather this and we can move on. But the reality is my trust has been so broken so many times. And I think I've just reached a point where like I'm not willing to tolerate it anymore, to be honest. And I don't know if it's like I reached my breaking point or I'm just like, I don't want to keep reliving the same cycle internally, psychologically. There's so much that I've had to hold on to internally without speaking about it, without sharing it, kind of accepting the outside version of how things look, right? But yeah, I, I think I just reached a point where it's like, I want to change the story now. I don't want to keep telling the same story about like how this guy was an asshole and he betrayed my trust and blah, 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 life goes on. Like I'm tired of that and I'm tired of men not being held accountable and I'm tired of people having no consequences and I'm tired of just like shrugging and being like, oh, well, maybe in another 10 years we'll all like give a shit. It just feels like things things that are different and we've all reached like a breaking point, I think, in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, it felt like I it's, it's not really an option anymore to not share these things, especially when I find out that this person specifically is touring and headlining and trying to grope girls still like in real time. It's just not acceptable anymore. So I'm hoping this is like a shift for everyone. It feels that way. I don't know if your podcast just gives me hope, but like it feels like people are shifting, um, becoming more aware and more willing to talk about it and talk about like the dirty parts of this kind of stuff. So I hope that's the case. And I hope at the very least, I hope somebody who has had this experience with this person or someone similar that feels like they're too big to speak back to, you know, I hope that whoever needs to hear it, hears it and knows that like how it doesn't matter how big or small the abuser is, that story is important and other people need to hear it and other people need to still be protected on a daily, nightly basis. And that won't happen if we don't talk about these things. Enough is a podcast centering on surviving abuse, harassment and assault in the music scene. To help get the word out, please like and subscribe and share with your friends. If you have been on the receiving end of harm from someone, be it artist, venue owner, booking agent, audience member, or someone else, and would like to share your story on a future episode, please reach out to us at thisisenoughpodcast at gmail.com. All correspondences are kept confidential.